ancient biblical prophets wrote about the future. Today, theologians are poring over those scriptures with a firm belief that their prophecies are coming to pass. Journey now into the world of eschatology on Prophecy in the News with author and lecturer J.R. Church. This is 1999. It is the year of the euro. Europe has a new currency. Here's one of the bills. We are going to see some exciting things, I think, in Europe over the next couple of years. According to the uh, European Parliament Information Office, on January 1, 1999, a new currency will come into existence, the euro. By the middle of 2002, it should have replaced most national currencies within the European community and bring about full economic and monetary union. Gary Sturman is here to discuss with me 1999 <coughs> the year of the euro. Hmm. It is the year of the euro. The European dollar will be called the euro. And you'll be seeing a little symbol that looks like an E with two lines through it. And JR, here's a, a, a European magazine uh, published, of course, in Europe. And right here on the cover of this magazine, it says Euroland. And you know, a lot of people are uh, saying that this name will stick. That is, the United States of Europe may eventually come to be called Euroland. The land of the Euro. Land huh? of the Euro. Everything based on money. Right. The currencies, the various currencies of Europe, have some uh, unusual designs that we'd like to share with you on the program today. Let's begin with mm -hmm. the uh, lower denominations and move to the higher ones. And you were holding up a five euro note, and, and uh, it's interesting to me that, that uh, apparently there will be no one euro note. The one euro is going to be a coin. But then <clears throat> going upward from there, the five, ten, uh, twenty, and so forth, fifty, will be notes. Here, I just want to point out one thing. <clears throat> Notice the blank spot Yes. On the note. We've, we've noted this many times in the past. Here All the currencies of the world have this blank spot. Every single currency of the world, including the, the new dollars uh, and the higher denominations of the dollar bill. Uh, the blank spot here we have suggested is a spot that could be overprinted with a, uh, an overarching denomination, perhaps a world evaluation when the time comes. Mm -hmm. J.R., the, the design uh, of all of these bills, going all the way up to the 500 euro note, and we have them on the table here, on the front of each one is a, an architectural edifice, a Romanesque arch. And you can see the arch right here on the front of this 10 euro note. On the back of every bill is some form of a bridge. In this case, it's an ancient uh, medieval bridge. And I think on Rome the, and the five. Go ahead and show the five. Yeah, there. the five euro note here again has a Romanesque arch on the front side of the bill. On the back side, we have a Roman bridge that dates all the way. Back. I think this one is a Spanish uh, edifice. This, this one happens to be in Spain, but this is one of those old combination bridges and aqueducts that the Romans used to build. Now, each of these bills shares the, the common feature of the arch and the bridge. Of course, the, the symbolism of the bridge is building Europe. That is, mm -hmm. bridging across the unbridgeable. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of interesting that uh, when President Clinton ran for the presidency this last time, he, that was his theme. Let, uh, let me take you over the bridge into the next millennium. And I wonder yeah. if perhaps this is the same a theme that the, um, shall we say, those who would desire to have a new world order, a yeah. one world government, have gotten together and promoted this idea of a bridge into the next millennium. Yeah, well, I'm certain that when it comes to monetary matters, there is global planning. I've got here a picture. These are facsimile pictures. This happens to be a two euro coin. Uh, this is a 10 euro cent. You get the idea. On every one of these coins, JR, we have a, a representation of Europe and the 12 stars of the European Union. Why 12 stars? We're going to get into that in a moment, but it seems a little strange because there are not 12 nations in the common market. Yeah, now, these smaller currencies have the ancient arches and the ancient bridges. When you get to the yeah. higher currencies, 
then it becomes more modern, doesn't it? Exactly. And for example, uh, here is the uh, the 500 euro note, and you can see that the architecture on this has become extremely modern, modernistic. And here's a modern uh, glass and steel arch. On the back side uh, of this one is a, still a bridge, but it's a modern suspension bridge. And so. Uh, the message across the currency seems to be we're going from the ancient to the modern, we're bridging across Europe, and the Romanesque arch has a significance all of its own, this edifice. Uh, it sort of says past, present, and future. And some people would say, well, you know, that's perfectly in keeping with the Bible, which says something about a revived Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly ties them historically back to the Roman Empire. Yes, it does. Now, it all began after World War II. I think it was um, uh, Winston Churchill who, in 1946, gave a speech wherein he suggested that the nations of Europe get together to have a single union. Mm -hmm. Of course, this is what Hitler tried to do. That's right. Uh, by force. And actually, you know, this um, Holy Roman Empire, this Roman Empire crumbled under its own uh, decadence. And uh, a little a little children's poem uh, emerged out of the history of Europe uh, referring to the Holy Roman Empire as Humpty Dumpty. Yeah. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, similar to one of these bridges, you know. <laughs> yes. Had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men could not put Humpty together again, but I want you to know Humpty is being put back together again. That's true. And that's what this is all about, isn't it? It is. As you said, in 1946, uh, Winston Churchill, speaking in Switzerland, spoke uh, uh, of the need to create a kind, as he put it, a kind of United States of Europe. And then, J.R., in 1948, which I believe is the, perhaps the signal year of this century, everything seems to have happened in 1948. Israel statehood. But you know, in Europe, on April 16th of 1948, uh, the European nations set up what they call the Organization for Economic, uh, European Economic Cooperation, the OEEC, which was the foundation of what we have today mm -hmm. as Euroland, all these many years later. And, and the progress has been, uh, shall we say, painful. It, that's the best thing you can say about it. Mm -hmm. Because essentially everybody has wanted to be in control. No one wants to be is sitting in the back seat of this thing. Yeah. And there's been a great deal of infighting. Uh, Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. That is it. <laughs> in April of 1951, the Treaty of Paris <clears throat> brought together what was called the Community of the Six. Uh, and these would be six nations, Germany, Italy, France, and the Benelux countries, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Benelux is the acronym. And so that was really the foundation, 1951, uh, three years after uh, the OEEC was formed. And then by June of 1955, uh, European unification really picked up speed. Uh, the, uh, there was a committee that many of you may remember under Paul-Henri Spock uh, that uh, looked into ways to expedite a united Europe. Well, I've got lots of names, dates, and places here, but... You know this, this Mr. Spock? Yes. S-P-A-A-K. <laughs> right. Uh, as I recall, he was the man who stood before the parliament and said, uh, we need a, a leader, a single leader, be he God or the devil, let him appear and we will follow him. That is exactly right. That's, <laughs> that's an invitation for the Antichrist to please stand up and come forward. Well, and that's where it's all headed, isn't it's it? It's all headed that way, and uh, the question that we're going to attempt to answer in this program and probably the next one is, will the United Europe, let's call it Euroland, will Euroland turn out to be prophetically significant, and if so, in what way? The community by uh, June of 1971 had grown to nine states, and then uh, on January 1st, 1981, uh, Greece became the 10th member of the European uh, uh, community, in, uh, and the first European passports were issued in 85. And uh, finally, by 1991, a number of countries had come in, and I, I wish I had time to detail all of the machinations that brought various countries into the, the complex of nations that we are looking at as Euroland. But by the time we had moved into the 90s, JR, there were a potential 
of 22 possible members that were uh, entitled for membership in the European Economic Community. That is, they can come in if they want to. Mm -hmm. And they, many have said, we don't want to yet. Now, with the development of dispensational premillennialism, and especially with the coming of this century, with World War I, World War II, the Balfour Declaration, the liberation of Jerusalem in 1917, the birth of Israel in 1948, and the EEC in 1948, with the European Common Market, most theologians had, had determined that, na that Europe would eventually have ten nations, and that they would be the ten nations of the revived Roman Empire that uh, uh, commensurate with the ten horns in Daniel chapter 7 on his fourth beast, and also this beast that rises up out of the sea in uh, Revelation chapter 13. The question is, is this the beast? We'll tell you when we get back. Don't go away. The euro is going to become a formidable currency. In fact, it will be in competition with the United States dollar as the world currency. And the question is, which one of them, if either, will emerge the strongest? Gary, mm -hmm. uh, as we look at <coughs> Europe, what does this single currency uh, portend? What, what are the possibilities that are coming? Well, for one thing, it, it does something very interesting to Europe at large, and that is that uh, as individual countries, Europe has, uh, has, each of the countries of Europe have had the ability to devalue their currencies. And we've seen this, you know, how many million lira it takes to buy an ice cream cone or something. In other words, when the economy goes bad, uh, they just crank up the printing presses, devalue the money, and so forth. Now, with the euro, that will not be possible. In other words, every country will be linked to the same economic base, so devaluation will no longer be a possibility, which means that the strong countries of Europe will have to support the weaker economic units, uh, which is going to be an incentive to pull everybody together and build up Europe as a whole. Now, that's never been done in the past, so there will be a new incentive to build up the country. And uh, the other thing is, there's great fear uh, on the part of the weaker countries that they'll be left uh, holding the bag, so to speak. They won't be able to wield enough power politically. So uh, it's not going to be a, an entirely well, a one-way street to, to heaven. It's not really going to be difficult for all these central banks to merge into one central bank. They're all owned by the same people anyway, yeah. including the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States. It is not a federal bank. It is not owned by the United States government. It is a private entity, international banking cartel. There is an interesting development in our own country that I'd like to uh, input at this point from World Net Daily on um, November 24, 1998. Uh, the federal, uh, the FDIC has issued a statement and these are excerpts from the article. Let me uh, uh, preface it by saying the federal government will soon track all financial transactions at banking institutions and businesses for the use of cash for payments over $100 may soon be illegal and all paychecks will be made through direct deposit, like it or not. The proposed regulation will require FDIC insured non-member banks to develop and maintain a quote, know your customer program. All other federal supervisory agencies will also enact the same regulation to prevent bank customers from moving their funds to avoid the regulation. I quote from this FDIC document, as proposed, the regulation would require each non-member bank to develop a program designed to determine the identity of its customers, determine its customer source of funds, determine the normal and expected transactions of its customers, monitor account activity for transactions that are inconsistent, with those normal and expected transactions and report any transactions of its customers that are determined to be suspicious in accordance with the FDIC's existing suspicious activity reporting regulation. Uh, Gary, basically this says that everybody's going to have to get a bank account. It and does. that no, no payment for any individual thing can be made with cash. That's correct. If it's over $100. And so actually, all of these um, pictures of the coinage or the uh, certificates and what have you, the 
of the euro and our new Federal Reserve currency, uh, the Federal Reserve notes, uh, they're really, as they are born, they are dying, aren't they? That is correct. I, I think that this is only a step toward what the Bible calls the mark, which is going to be some kind of a computer mark. And let me just say quickly that we have, as you pointed out a moment ago, a situation in which world banks are merging at record rates, producing huge entities that can control humanity. In fact, that's their desire. And I have here a quote from the European that I held up just a moment ago. <clears throat> Euroland is already the world's second largest economic zone after the United States. Its gross domestic product amounts to $6.4 trillion, not far behind the United States' $7.4 trillion. Its 11 constituent countries will make up the world's largest importer and exporter. Up to 30% of world trade will be conducted in euros, and the status of the dollar as the global reserve currency of choice could be about to change. And so mm -hmm. here we have the dollar, the Western currency, uh, in, co in competition with the euro, which is the new dollar, shall we say. But the Bible says, J.R., that ultimately neither the dollar nor the euro will be the currency. It's going to be something else, a number, mm -hmm. and the number of a name and a mark, which certainly doesn't sound like paper currency to me. Yes, that gets, of course, back. Now, there will always be some kind of paper currency. Uh, but for major transactions, this, any transaction over $100 is going to be monitored by the government. Uh, basically, that's the same as saying you've got to have a mark in your right hand or in your forehead before you can spend over $100. Mm -hmm. That's, that's right. the same as the mark of the beast. It's the enslavement of the human race. And this blank spot right here is probably the main feature of all these currencies of the world. So that one of these days... Uh, whatever final merge is made for all these banks to merge into one central world bank, it, all they need is to imprint right there and require identification. Identification, by the way, is the main secret to all of this. In fact, this article, Gary, says uh, that uh, the banks need to develop and maintain a quote, know your customer program. Well. That's the same thing as personal identification. You know? know your customer, in this case, meaning know his habits. Yes. Spy on him. Let's, That's right. Let's just put it the way it is. Big Brother of 1984, <laughs> George Orwell's book. That's right. And it's coming, it's coming incredibly fast. Now, the question is, will Europe lead the way? Yeah. Uh, you know, we know that Europe had a Roman Empire. That's right. And uh, it, was a, it, it became a world government in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the book of the Revelation, we are told that there will emerge another world empire, and it will be fashioned after the Roman Empire. But it will be global in nature rather than uh, confined to the continent of Europe. So let's talk about that, Gary. Well, let's just ask the question, what does the euro or euro land have to do with Bible prophecy? And J.R., a lot of the thinking in the 20th century has been influenced by Alexander Hislop, who wrote The Two Babylons. By the way, we're not offering this book, but you can get it at your Christian bookstore, The Two Babylons. Hislop, in 1916, <clears throat> wrote what I consider to be the definitive description of Mystery Babylon as a Roman entity <clears throat> in Revelation uh, uh, 17, 9, it says, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And, of course, the woman is Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. Well, Hislop uh, wrote, No other city in the world has ever been celebrated as the city of Rome has for its situation on seven hills. And he goes on and on in great detail, quoting ancient Roman authors, all of whom supported the idea yeah. that the seven-hilled city was, was Rome. And in fact, the little idiom, the man from seven hills, used to be the emblem of Roman citizenship. That is, if you mm -hmm. called yourself a man of seven hills, it was the same as saying you were a Roman. Therefore, Hislop said, the Roman church is going to be the origin point for the beast of Revelation 13 <clears throat> and Revelation 14. And it's interesting that he quoted Virgil, who said, Rome has become the most beautiful city in the world and alone has surrounded for herself seven heights with a wall. Yeah. He quoted 
Uh, how do you pronounce that name? Uh, Propertius. Okay. Propertius. I can't say it very <laughs> well. Propertius, who said, the lofty city on seven hills which governs the whole world. Well, yeah. Rome certainly, in the days of John's writing, probably was the symbolic um, statement for the future mystery Babylon. Now, if you think back to all of the Bible teachers you've heard talk about a revived empire of the last days, they call it the revived Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. The reason they did, by and large, is because of Hislop's book. Uh, Alexander, and by the way, this is a great book and worthy of study, but he didn't have the whole picture as we do now. He was writing back in 1916. There were a lot of things he couldn't see. And we're going to make the point, <clears throat> as their study continues, that though a revived Europe is very important in the scheme of things, extremely important because the Bible says that out of the Roman bloodline will come the Antichrist, mm -hmm. it also mentions Rome. So it's extremely important in that respect, but on the other hand, we have already stated that uh, the revived empire is going to be global in nature. Therefore, there's a connection between Europe and the globe, and this is what we're going to investigate. You know, in our final moment, I want to mention that Great Britain has been a holdout. Yes. And so your statement there uh, that you read a moment ago talked about the 11 nations, though there are 12 in the uh, European common market. Now, what's going to happen to Great Britain? Will they come around, and how long would it take them? That's, that's going to be an interesting study. It's going to be interesting. And I think that as you uh, join us for the next part of this study, you're going to learn something about the growth of, of the Roman Empire in the latter days that you may not have suspected before. The Euro is definitely a very important development toward world government. More on the next program. <laughs>